Hello, um, now it's time to round up the series on the modelling of the mind um, according to the Modular Cognition Framework, uh, developed by myself and John Truscott, but intended to give people a kind of research framework or a way of thinking about how the mind works in general um, and what is the role of the different systems that we have in our mind. Um, uh, my area of course is language and I'm very interested in language in the brain and language in the mind. Um, and the role of language uh, uh, or rather its uh, place in the mind is uh, of great interest to me but I very carefully only devoted one of these eight presentations to language. So you will see this is very much um, an interdisciplinary look at the mind and um, it uh, allows for um, a basic, uh, let's say, template uh, with some principles and um, assumptions built into it, but nonetheless with much of it unelaborated. Of course, uh, John Truscott and myself, uh, being linguists, uh, psychologists, uh, have elaborated uh, and are elaborating the language side of it. So it, we're implementing the framework, but it is a framework and it is, can be implemented by anyone. Anyone can, can, can add to it and uh, contribute. Uh, but in this uh, introductory series, um, I, I first began, and I'm doing this more or less in a series of 20 points, um, reprising a little of the each of the presentations we've had so far. Uh, the first was just to make absolutely sure that we do not confuse the mind, which is the organization, uh, the abstract organization, um, with the physical brain, which is uh, can be found sitting in your skull, all uh, 1.3, 1.4 kilograms of it, more three pounds if you like. Um, and um, the physical brain uh, is uh, also an object of in independent study by neuroscientists. But it's the mind, um, in, my s in my sense of mind, it's the mind that drives the brain. Uh, if you're looking at it from the other point of view, you could say uh, it, the brain implements uh, the, the, the mind. So we're going to look at the mind. And we can uh, certainly simplify things. Um, looking at the brain would be like looking at the London Underground system literally with all its wires and uh, winding tunnels and uh, blinking lights and things. Now we're going to look at the system and uh, uh, having established that uh, we want to know how the mind is organized and it's organized as a, a, as a set of systems. Each of these systems um, form a kind of network because they're interconnecting, they interact. And in each part of the mind, in each of these systems, we have a type of knowledge which is developed over your lifetime. Uh, and each system indeed has a unique function it is not shared by any other system. It's there because it does a specialist job that no, none of the others do. Right? So it is a uniquely functionally specialised system. But nonetheless, um, despite this uh, uniqueness, this specialisation, um, all of them have the same basic design and they all consist of a processor uh, and a store. There they are. Uh, the store is represented as a, as a square and the little dots are the sort of representations, the knowledge structures, uh, um, some of which will be there at birth, but most of them, the vast majority of them, will accumulate over a lifetime and uh, be more or less available uh, for use. And the processor is simply uh, contains, as I say, it's a toolbox it contains a special processing principles. So uh, if it's, this is the visual system, these will be the 
the visual principles that decide how a visual representation is composed and um, how single representations can be combined with others. It has, the, it has the, as it were, it's the grammar of this, of this particular system. Um, um, and uh, moving on to our fifth point, representations uh, in different stores, uh, although they're very different in the way they're composed uh, and can't be simply merged into another one, they can nonetheless be associated and co-activated one with the other in parallel at the same time. And um, they do this via interfaces, connecting interfaces. Here's an example from one of the slides I used. Um, you have a, a visual representation in the middle in the visual store, the store represented in the dotted line. Right? And it's uh, it's uh, there at the top, and it's um, it's 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 not sitting there in its in splendid isolation, because uh, it has already been associated with a particular sound, and a particular taste, right? So you could imagine a number of things that could have um, taste associations, sound associations, and uh, visual associations. Uh, but the point is here that if one of these is activated, the other ones are activated immediately at the same time. In other words, they are co-activated. So um, that shows how uh, completely different types of representations can nonetheless play a part in the mind as a whole because associated uh, uh, representations can be co-activated together. And this is extremely important for solving all the complicated tasks that our minds have to solve uh, in milliseconds sometimes. We don't get much time. So um, next, uh, the sixth one, the sixth mm -hmm. point is that there's an outer ring of perceptual systems. Right, The number of perceptual systems are not completely fixed. At the moment I think we have about 10 or 11. Um, uh, but uh, the ones that really uh, help us navigate uh, and, and cope with the physical environment around us uh, extremely important and activated frequently in order to uh, keep us from uh, bumping into things or um, sitting on tigers or uh, all those other things that we should watch out for. These are the perceptual systems and they form a kind of outer ring if you imagine uh, the environment as an outside world with the mind as a sort of circle in the middle. Um, these form an outer ring and each of them has a particular type of perceptual knowledge and this is linked with the each of the five senses for which feed into them the signals, the patterns of activity that come in from the outside world uh, um, into the ears, the eyes, uh, the nose, etc. Here they are represented and the lines are the interfaces because it's a richly interconnected system. It's a sort of, it's almost a system in its own right. Uh, but here are the independent systems with their stores and processors. Um, here they are. I usually leave the processors out, take them for granted, uh, but I've actually included them in this one. And they're all linked together. So, somatose entry system, the visual system, the gustatory system, right, taste, the olfactory system, um, taking care of uh, the kind of accumulation of, of um, smell representations we get, and all of these can have associations with all of the others uh, via these interfaces. Number seven, there's also an affective system, incredibly important, often underestimated system, which handles uh, value, the assignment of positive and negative values, and it also takes care uh, of the basic emotions, which are somehow a combination of uh, representations which always include a positive or a negative value. And um, this is the affective system. So uh, here it is, um, and I just want to point out what basic emotions are involved. These are the very primitive ones that we, we, we share with, the, with animals. This in fact is a primitive system 
uh, and we find it in all sorts of uh, beings on this planet and uh, the basic uh, joy, rage, disgust, these sort of uh, re emotional responses to, the, to what we experience are all pretty basic. Uh, and um, but the, the, there are certainly uh, complex emotions, and these complex emotions, we think, um, are associations with basic emotions, but made more complex by their associations with different meanings. So, pride, for example, um, and humility. Humility um, could be a positive emotion. Could be somehow linked with. Um, fear but isn't fear so uh, layered onto uh, uh, some basic emotions are, are these extra meanings which make them complex so if you want to define all the emotions that we uh, that we are uh, can experience we won't be able to do it only using representations in this store so uh, i'm just talking about meanings uh, and meanings of course um, are the domain of the conceptual system um, and uh, um, abstract meanings uh, or in their millions uh, can be uh, developed in this over the lifetime uh, by human beings and one of the striking uh, unique characteristics of human beings um, when they uh, set aside their closest relatives is this, de uh, this is so, so far further developed uh, than in any of their nearest relatives. Um, conceptual store uh, I described uh, often functions as a hub we think that um, it, it is in we think basically the mind doesn't have some kind of central processor or something su that supervisory system organizing everything for us um, uh, because um, most of what we uh, what what happens in our brain uh, is, is beyond our conscious awareness we don't know what's going on um, it'd be nice to think that there is a sort of a, a man in charge or a woman in charge or a thing in charge um, but there isn't um, um, and uh, some people perhaps would like to make the promote the conceptual system to some kind of organizing supervisor but it absolutely isn't but it does act as a hub for many other things it, it acts as a hub so the smells have meanings touch has meanings images have meanings sounds have meanings emotions have meanings very often um, uh, the associations run in this kind of direction making the conceptual system a hub and um, it, its sphere of influence of course therefore spreads out right across other systems in the mind so very, very important, the conceptual system. Um, well, so as I say, that's the story so far. Uh, and added to the outer ring of perceptual system, we put in the conceptual system, which allows meanings to be associated with any of these other systems. And indeed, uh, the emotional affective system, which allows values and emotions, the basic emotions, to be linked up and associated and co-activated with uh, any of the other systems. Number nine, uh, representations, they all have a current resting level, a resting level of activation. Um, um, there they are, um, resting nicely at particular levels. Um, and um, this becomes important later when we talk about working memory. What is working memory? Well, when a representation in any store is activated, apart from co-activating anything that happens to be associated with it in or outside the store, um, it is by virtue of being activated in a working memory state. So working memory isn't some little secret room somewhere. It's not a separate system. It hasn't got a different location in our map of the mind. It's simply the state in which representations entered enter when they're activated. And when they're no longer activated, where they cease to be activated, then they just fall 
down and to their resting level and uh, they are no longer in working memory. And the eleventh point was that each time a representation is activated its current resting level will be boosted. So activation has an effect on the resting levels. So it rises up as it were. We use the metaphor of height, you know. Um, it rises up uh, and it may rise up just a little bit uh, if it's only weakly activated. Um, but uh, or right to the top as it were if it's very strongly activated but um, whatever that however it is um, it, when it comes back to its previous uh, uh, state of um, non-activation it will not be at the same resting level the resting level will be slightly boosted so a frequency with which a particular representation is activated uh, for one reason or another um, uh, uh, has a close relationship to the way it gets gradually uh, boosted and established over time until its resting level is very high and that makes it um, uh, more accessible uh, if, um, in some sense. The twelfth point was that um, when we're processing online when the, when the mind is trying to solve some kind of task using all the knowledge systems at its disposal there will be a, 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 a frantic competition. Competition certainly between representations um, within a particular system as they both vie for, um, for, be, for participation in the current task um, and indeed um, across, uh, across uh, various knowledge systems. So competition is a key uh, feature of mental activity and uh, uh, how high the resting level is um, is rather important in that context. Um, so all other things being equal, the higher a representation's current resting level happens to be, the more competitive it becomes. It is, if you like, um, less handicapped. Uh, it has a shorter route to the top and the top is where the action is. Uh, human language, this is our 14th point, 14th point of the 20. Human language, uh, and now I do get on to my pet subject, human language involves more than using individual symbols and each having a meaning, uh, usually one, and this characterizes uh, the kind of communication that Kanzi the Bonobo uh, uh, developed to an amazing ability, uh, to an amazing extent. It really is fantastic um, uh, that he should be able to use them in such a clever way. But of course human language uses symbols which uh, individually have no meaning at all and they only have meaning when they're combined and when they're combined they're combined in all sorts of complicated ways and that takes uh, human language way beyond um, what uh, our brilliant bonobo is able to achieve. And the two systems that are responsible for this uh, in our framework, um, some linguists would say only one was necessary, there happens to be two in our, in our framework, uh, the phonological system um, which takes care of the primary speech structure, um, I also mentioned sign language uh, but uh, you can refer back to that if you're interested, uh, phonological structure and syntactic structure. So adding these two to a kind of um, network of uh, associated and co-activated representations enables us to use, uh, to express our thoughts using the medium of language. And, and now we're in territory which are definitely not shared by other species. Um, take an auditory uh, representation. Um, it, it, it can be associated with a, a speech structure, phonological structure, and it can be uh, associated also with the visual uh, structure, namely a, a piece of text, written text, or a, a, sign, a, sign, a signing uh, gesture. Um, and, and, and these can be uh, linked with uh, syntax. Um, so it provides um, 
linguistic structure, that's to say uh, this group of two systems is, uh, provide linguistic structure, but uh, when we're talking about language in general and language use, it's not these two small systems I'm talking about uh, exclusively, I'm talking about really the whole of the mind, because the moment you start using language, all the associations uh, across the mind in many other systems as well are being activated. So language is definitely a mind-wide phenomenon. And here it is embedded in the mind, you see. Here's the, here's the two systems, but these interfaces um, are linked all over the, all over the shoppers. Uh, mean, the meaning hub and all its associations um, and the emotional and value systems um, and representations, all of those, it's, it's, it's a mind-wide uh, system. That's um, a reason, I think, for anyone to be at least a little interested in language, even if they don't want to do linguistics. 16. Um, moving on to uh, the consciousness and attention. Um, uh, I said that we can be conscious of only a very small percentage of our mental activity. You may remember uh, the 5% was mentioned. Uh, that was a purely arbitrary figure, but 95% um, um, of what we do, let's say, 95% of our mind is, is hidden from us. Um, so um, uh, you might find that disturbing, but I suggested it was um, actually a pretty good thing uh, because um, it spared you all that conflict and competition that goes on. You're mercifully free from that. And our 17, uh, 17th point is that conscious awareness um, depends on very high levels of activation. So activation is the key, really, to explaining uh, how conscious awareness uh, works. Uh, we can't explain consciousness itself, uh, but we can explain a little about how it works in the mind, and it does depend on extremely high levels of activation. And um, attention, um, because uh, awareness can be very general, uh, but uh, at some point you do focus on something, and you focus very carefully on one particular thing, and that's when uh, the representations involved, or it would, might be a single representation or a, or a, a very closely associated s group of representations, when they come into focus, it means that they rise up even further than anything else uh, in, and, and therefore gain our attention. So uh, attention itself is part of the story of the conscious awareness and is not something separate. And our 19th and penultimate point it was precisely that, that thinking is a partly conscious process. Why is it partly con conscious? Because we don't have